Dr. Meyer Friedman of the Mount Zion Hospital in San Francisco. He wrote the book on type A and type B personalities. He believes in the stress theory to some extent, but he was concerned about the American Heart Association recommendations that it's all right to eat your natural diet as you eat in this country, but just change the kind of fat that you eat. Use polyunsaturates instead of saturated fats. He knew that saturated fats created blockages of the, of the vessels in the body, but he never tested polyunsaturated fats. So he got together about 40 firemen from San Francisco, and after an overnight fast, photographed the fine vessels in their eyes and noted that they were all wide open. And if you look at his article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, you'll be able to see the vessels all open. And then he gave them a glass of heavy cream. Five hours after the cream drink, you could probably see 25 blockages in the eyes of these firemen. And you can see those photographs in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, later on, when he took the same firemen and this time gave them a drink of polyunsaturated fat, which is safflower oil, a very popular polyunsaturated fat, five hours after the drink, the blockages were just as severe and just as many as with the butterfat. The difference was that with the butterfat drink, nine hours after the test, the butterfat had gotten out of the system. But with the safflower oil, nine hours after the test, the polyunsaturated fat had not yet started to leave the system. We don't know when it got out of the system. He stopped his test in nine hours. Dr. Friedman was very concerned and in his summary of his article said he warns against the idea of substituting polyunsaturates for saturates, especially when both block just as effectively the small vessels in the body. He urged the reduction of all fats. That was 1965. We wonder when the American Heart Association is going to read their own material. It's only been 13 years. If you look at the latest cookbook the American Heart Association has put out just last year, and you look through the recipes, you'll have to wash your hands afterwards because they're filled with corn oil. Every recipe just about has corn oil in it. The American Heart Association doesn't seem to agree with Dr. Friedman. Well, how important is diet in coronary heart disease? And first, I should say that heart disease is a bad term because in most cases, unless you've had a heart attack, there's nothing wrong with your heart. Your heart's as good as it was when you were a teenager. The problem is not heart disease, it's artery disease. The little vessels, the coronary vessels that feed your heart are narrowed, and they're narrowed so much that you begin to have symptoms. The heart muscle is struggling to keep alive, not enough blood flow, which means not enough oxygen. And that's what heart disease is, closure of the arteries that feed the heart, like any other muscle would have. So that artery disease is our real problem. And when we talk about diet and heart disease, how important is it? We can only look at the Framingham study. The Framingham study has been going on for almost 30 years now. 5,200 people have been monitored every two years with extensive examinations, and all the scientists did was to watch them live, watch them die, watch them get their heart attacks, watch them get diabetes, and so on. They offer them no advice. They just monitor them. And what we find in the Framingham study, if your cholesterol level is 260 or higher, you have 400% greater incidence of coronary events and deaths than if it's 220 or less. It doesn't take a great difference in cholesterol level to create a tremendous excess in coronary deaths. We find this so with many of the studies. But these are studies where we're observing. It'd be interesting to go right to angiographic studies, like the Cleveland Clinic studies. Cleveland Clinic, one of the largest surgical institutions in the country, has been doing angiographic studies, coronary angiograms, x-rays of the inside of the coronary arteries for many, many years. They've done thousands of these. And they have been able, because of their vast experience, make correlations between what they see in the x-ray of the inside of the arteries and other factors. And they feel that cholesterol level seems to be the principal predictive factor for closing your arteries. For example, if your cholesterol level is under 200, they find that only one out of five of the people who come through their center have significantly closed coronary arteries. But if the cholesterol level is 360 or more, 91% have significant closure. And they find that in every step, as cholesterol level rises, the arteries are more closed. More people have closed arteries. Cleveland Clinic decided that they had so much confidence in their work, they did what we call a double-blind study. That means the original physicians that looked at the data didn't know who the patients were, and the patients didn't know who were doing their tests and so on. Sixty men came into Cleveland Clinic, 
and they had their age, cholesterol levels, and triglyceride levels taken. A group of physicians that never had to see the patients took these three numbers, cholesterol level, age, and triglycerides. The age was important because that tells us how long the cholesterol has been at that level, piling up in the body. And they made a prediction based on all their experience as to which of these 60 are going to have significantly closed coronary arteries. The men then went to the radiologist. The angiograms were taken, and then they tabulated the closure of the arteries against the original predictions. And out of the original 60 predictions, 59 were absolutely correct. One mistake out of 60. There's no better predictive test in the world, 98% predictive accuracy. And all they have to know is what your cholesterol level is and your triglyceride level and your age. So if anyone tells you that cholesterol level is not a good factor in predicting closure of the arteries, refer them to the Cleveland Clinic study. Now there are many diets around the world. There are hundreds of different diets. And many diets are associated with artery closure. Many diets are not. But there are principally only two kinds of diets in our world. There's the high-fat diet of the developed nations, and then there's a very low-fat diet of the undeveloped nations. The high-fat diet has 40 to 45 percent of its total calories in fat, 500 to 1,000 milligrams of cholesterol, which is like eating two or three eggs a day. And the countries in the developing nations have about 10 or 15 percent total calories in fat in their diet, and less than 100 milligrams of cholesterol, which is about eating a pound or pound and a half of animal protein a week. Our diet here is monitored and modeled after the undeveloped nations where heart disease is rarely found and all the other degenerative diseases are rarely found. And some people say, well, maybe your diet is deficient. Maybe that's why it should not be used. I'd like to tell you that the diet that we use meets all the federal RDA requirements, the required daily allowances in all factors, protein, minerals, vitamins, and so on, with plenty of room to spare, so we have no concern there. So if the diet, as we're advocating, turns out to be a solution in all these diseases, why isn't it used? Well, probably one reason it isn't used is because the American Heart Association that sets the style for diets in our country for heart disease has decided 15 or more years ago that they want maximum compliance. They know that cholesterol level in excess is bad in the blood. Nobody questions anymore that high cholesterol levels will lead to closure of your arteries. The only question is, how do you lower cholesterol levels successfully? In the 1950s, the diet studies show that if you lower cholesterol level by cutting it out of the diet, you did slow down closure of the arteries, you saved people's lives. And the same studies show that any other way to do it just didn't work. But the American Heart Association happened to see the work of a particular investigator, Dr. Kinsella Berkeley, who noted that polyunsaturated fats lowers the cholesterol in the blood. And they said, that's a terrific idea. We won't let anyone have to change their diet and get a low-fat, low-cholesterol diet. We'll let them use exactly what they're eating all the time, change the kind of fat. And that's what they did in their 1961 recommendation, which was their first recommendations, don't change anything, just change the kind of fat you're having. They thought they'd get the maximum compliance that way, and they certainly did. Maximum compliance, minimum effectiveness. Because we've now had a number of American Heart Association diet trials, Oslo, London, and Wadsworth VA Hospital. The Oslo 11-year study with 400 men, London 6-year study, 400 men, Wadsworth 8-year study, 846 men, Half the men on the American Heart Association diet, half on the standard American kind of diet. And yet the difference between both groups was no more than 5% death rate. Not a significant difference. It could happen by chance. Yet on the low-fat, low-cholesterol diets that were tried out in the 1950s, there was a 50% difference in death rate. Twice as many deaths on the standard American diet than the low-fat, low-cholesterol diet. So the diet approach by the American Heart Association hasn't worked in the many large-scale programs. And the latest fiasco, the Mr. Fit study, Mr. Fit means multiple risk factor intervention trial, 12,000 men are on a greatly elaborated American Heart Association trial. 6,000 men on their new and improved diet, which is like the old one, 6,000 men on the regular American diet. The study is going to cost you at least $100 million, the six-year study.